how do you prepare for revival? At the base of this word, revival, vive means to live. And to revive means to live again. So this isn't necessarily for those outside of the church, although everyone is welcome. These meetings, these five on-purpose meetings that we'll have starting next Sunday morning will be to revive the church. To say, Lord, bring us alive afresh and anew with You. And that as we are revived, we then go out and make a difference to bring about awakening in the community. But revival happens in the church first. We're going to talk about some very basic principles of revival today and then pleading with the Lord that He might revive us. I want you to put on your thinking caps, your creative thinking caps, and I want you to imagine right now what it would look like for you if God so radically came and manifested Himself upon your heart, what would that look like for you personally? Think about that. What would that look like? Think of the best thing that would happen in your life. What would your conversations be like? What would your your job be like? What would your relationships with neighbors and family be like? Think about that. If God really revived you, what would that look like? Then I want you to think about this. What if, if all of us got revived in here as a church? What would that look like? If all of us were just radically obedient to the Lord and submissive to His Spirit, spirit husbands speaking kindly to wives and vice versa, and children obeying their parents, what would it look like if we got revived? God wants to revive us, doesn't He? Is God the problem? If, if God would just kind of make up His mind and decide to revive us, wouldn't, isn't it His sovereignty? Doesn't He just decide to revive people? No. When you look throughout Scripture, you always see there was somebody set to praying. Somebody set to praying and saying, God, I want more than I've got now. Lord, I want to be stronger in You. I want to see my neighbors won. I want to see my family saved. Lord, I need revival in me. God always worked through somebody who was praying. Think about that. As I said, uh, Dr. Stephen Manley will be here, and then that fine fella, Reverend Brad Flack, singing, leading us in worship. Pray for Dr. Manley that he would give timely messages to us, that God would revive us, that God would speak to our hearts and so rearrange the furniture of our life that we're never the same again. Do you want more? Do you want more from God's Spirit? You want more power, more intimacy? You want more love from the Lord? Then give yourself to prayer this week. We'll be talking about that. And right now, prayer, I want you to think about this, your personal life. Would you commit, I'm asking us as a church, would you commit to giving some special time to prayer this week? Maybe it's when you're doing your Bible study, but you would just set everything aside and say, Lord, I need revival in my life, personally. And then as a family, dads, moms, call your family together. Call them together. Maybe it's at the dinner table. Maybe it's when you're sitting down watching TV, turn it off and say, we're going to pray. Maybe you take three, five, ten minutes and you pray. Would you do that? Would you say, we're going to commit to praying this week as a family? And you can do this. You can do this. Uh, church board members, lead the way. Sunday school teachers, Christian ed board members, t- lead the way and lead your family in prayer this week. And then corporate prayer. This Wednesday we'll be praying, and I'm asking the whole church, I know we have prayer every Wednesday night, but... Every person in this room is invited. Uh, It doesn't cost us any more to have more people here. You can all come this Wednesday, 6 o'clock, say, well, I can't. Do your best. I know some of you can't by your jobs. You cannot get here at 6 o'clock. Come if you can and come around these altars and around the front. I'd like to see all of you here this Wednesday night at 6 o'clock for corporate prayer, asking God to pour out His Spirit upon us. Think you could do some of these things? If so, say amen. Amen. Me too. Fasting. How about that? What? We don't live in a fasting age, pastor. What are you talking about? Well, many times throughout Scripture, people would fast and pray to see God's hand move. 
So I'm calling us as a church, the whole church, to fast one 24-hour period. Could you do that? One 24-hour period. You pick the time, you pick the day. It's up to you. I'm not going to command you. I can't. It wouldn't do any good. But I can ask you and invite you as a church that all of us sometime this week would fast a 24-hour period. Maybe you eat breakfast and you don't eat again until breakfast the next day. I want us to fast and say, God, we desire your presence here so strongly that we're willing to give up sustenance, food, to say, Lord, we want you here. Could we do that as a church? A tw- you pick the time. A 24-hour period, you pick the time. Now, for those of you that are going on the cruise, I am so sorry. Maybe if you didn't eat breakfast this morning, don't eat until breakfast tomorrow morning, and then you're, you're good. Pray and ask the Lord to come and visit us. Every pr- your te- Teenagers, you can do this. Fast 24 hours and say, God, I want you to break in in my life. Break in in my life. We're going to be talking about good King Hezekiah. He's of Judah. You've got the northern kingdom, the ten tribes of Israel, and then the southern kingdom, the two tribes at the south, and Judah is one of those. But of all the kings, it spanned a time covering 464 years, and there were 42 kings in Israel and Judah, and only 11 of those were righteous. Think about that. Think how rocky that is of a history. Only 11 righteous kings in 464 years of kings. But it's said of Hezekiah, he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Let's talk about Hezekiah for just a moment. We're going to get into the scripture here. But king, he was the king of Judah at age 25, and he reigned 25 years, 700 B.C., somewhere in there to 600 B.C., and there's 29 years in there. His name means God has strengthened. The gospel of Matthew's lineage of Jesus Christ, it mentions him, and that he had great reform and devotion to God and spiritual renewal in his life. So I want you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 20, verses 1 through 11. 2 Kings chapter 20, verses 1 through 11. I'm going to look at this scripture together and see how God worked through prayer. Before we jump into this, there was great reform that happened. Uh, Hezekiah had all the altars and the, the altars of Baal and the high places, the Asherah poles chopped down. And, and restored Israel to, tr- to Judah to true worship. Restored Judah to true worship. Look at chapter 20, verses 1 through 11. In those days, Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amoz, went to him and said, This is what the Lord says. Put your house in order because you are going to die. You will not Recover. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. Remember, O Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Before Isaiah had left the middle court of the palace, the word of the Lord came to him, Go back and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, this is what the Lord, the God of your father David says, I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will heal you. On the third day from now, you will go up to the temple of the Lord. I will add 15 years to your life. And I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. I will defend this city for my sake and for the sake of my servant David. Then Isaiah said, prepare a poultice of figs. They did so and applied it to the boil, and he recovered. Hezekiah had asked Isaiah, what will be the sign that the Lord will heal me and that I will go up to the temple of the Lord on the third day from now? Isaiah answered, this is the Lord's sign to you that the Lord will do what he has promised. Shall the shadow go forward ten steps or degrees, or shall it go back Ten steps or degrees. It is a simple matter for the shadow to go forward ten steps or degrees, said Hezekiah. Rather have it go back ten steps or degrees. Then the prophet Isaiah called upon the Lord, and the Lord made the shadow go back the ten steps or degrees it had gone down on the stairway of Ahaz. Father, I pray for your anointing this morning upon us as we hear and believe and act upon your word. Bring revival. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. 
title of this message is Put Your House in Order. Put Your House in Order. Hezekiah's sickness, it's mentioned in three different places in Scripture. You could parallel these if you'd like to. 2 Kings 20, 2 Chronicles 32, and Isaiah 38. They all talk about the same story. The events as they unfolded. Isaiah tells the king to set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Very unpleasant words to hear. Put your house in order. Secondly, Hezekiah wept bitterly and he prayed to God. That's essential in this story. Thirdly, Isaiah is instructed to immediately return and inform the king his prayer had been answered. He received 15 additional years, and then the king also requested a sign. Very briefly, I'm going to go through these five points. A deadly sickness, a desperate prayer, a heartening promise, a human's participation, and a divine sign. Put your house in order. So firstly, a deadly sickness. He said, put your house in order because you're going to die. You will not recover. Now, is this good news or bad news? (laughs) Is it good news or bad news? I don't know. If if, if God came to you and he said, I'm going to tell you the day you're going to die, would that be good news or bad news? Some would say, oh, that'd be terrible news. I don't want to know the day I'm going to die. I'd rather just live free and not know. Others would like to say, yeah, I'd like to know the exact date. I can live however I please. And right before he comes back, I'll say, Lord, forgive me, and I'll get in. Is it good news or bad news? Think about that. Put your house in order. Uh, Ahithophel was a servant. He was a wise, sage uh, advisor to King David. And he left King David when King David needed him the most, when the, the kingdom was slipping from David's hand. And David's son Absalom was now in the palace. And Ahithophel leaves King David to go and give advice to King David's son Absalom. And David prays, God, would you confuse the advice of Ahithophel to my son's ears? And Ahithophel gives this great plan to go out and take David down. And it's the right words. They're the right thing. He's a very wise man. And then another man comes along and gives another word and confuses the advice. And so Absalom doesn't take Ahithophel's advice. And the Bible says that Ahithophel was so embarrassed by it Then he went home and he put his house in order. And then he went out and hung himself. He couldn't live with the embarrassment that his advice was no longer taken by the kingship. Ahithophel, he put his house in order. What does that mean? He probably made sure everything was all up up to date, paid off the last bills, told everybody goodbye, and went out and hung himself. He put his house in order. Jesus hanging on a cross. He knows he's about to die. And he looks down to his mother Mary, and to his close disciple John. And Jesus puts his house in order. He says, John, here is your mother. Mother, here is your son. Take care of her, is what he's saying. Jesus put his house in order. I want to ask you, if you knew you were going to die this week, what would you do to put your house in order? What would you do to put your house in order? What do you need to do? Let's see, it's not just the bills. Maybe I've got odds with somebody. Maybe I've got ought against somebody. I I need to make that right. Maybe, maybe Maybe I took some money from work, or maybe I've done this or that, and I need to I need to make that right. What do you need to do to put your house in order? Put your house in order this week. God doesn't do that for you. God doesn't make your little bony legs move. You do that. You are free will, you're a free moral agent. You must put your house in order. Secondly, a desperate prayer. This is from 2 Chronicles 32, different, uh, not 2 Kings, 2 Chronicles. Then Hezekiah repented of the pride in his heart, as did the people of Jerusalem. Therefore, the Lord's wrath did not come upon them during the days of Hezekiah. The middle letter of pride is I. When I'm proud, it's all about me. When I'm full of myself, it's just me, myself, and I. I'm a terrible person to be around when I'm prideful. And you might be as well. But pride never goes with revival. Pride must die before revival can come. And it's hard to say you're sorry, isn't it? It's hard to apologize. It's hard to say I was wrong. It's hard to say I messed up. But if you have, get rid of your pride and repent, humble yourself, and seek the Lord. 2 Chronicles 7.14, If my people, God says, if my people which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. That's a promise. 
God's not up there saying, well, you've done everything you need to do, but I'm, I'm going to wait a little bit longer. I, I've got a different timetable than you. No, God says, if my people will humble themselves, if they'll humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways, then he'll hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. How bad do you want healing? How bad do you want to be right with God? Are you willing to humble yourself and pray and say, oh God, rid me from all my wicked ways? A heartening promise, verses 4 through 6. God said, I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will heal you. That's the Hebrew word rapha. It means to restore, make healthful. God heals us still today, doesn't he? Now, God's timetable is different than ours, but God still heals today. It's one of our articles of faith in the Church of the Nazarene. We believe that God still heals today, amen? I remember Shree and I, uh, we were in Carthage under Pastor Tompkins and doing youth ministry there, and our, our son, Asher, uh, struggled with bedwetting. And uh, he was at upper elementary and still struggling, and we'd talk to doctors, and we were just very concerned, and it was tough. I remember I'd go to camp with my son, and we'd have to make arrangements with sleeping bag and me having an extra set of clothing and being able to take his, I talked to somebody there and was able to wash his uh, sleeping bag every day. And we'd stop the drinking like at you know, six o'clock at night and he'd be so thirsty by the morning. It was just a tough struggle. And Shri was just really praying and praying and praying, asking God to heal our son of the bedwetting. And I remember we had a revival there with Dan Bohai in Carthage. And I remember Shri just felt so urgent and she came forward, maybe even brought Asher with her, up to the front for anointing. It was, a t- it was a healing service. And she brought him forward, and I didn't know that she had that onus on her like that. And so I saw her, and I went over and stood with her, and, and Dan Bohai came over, and he prayed. And I think you kind of felt confirmation in your heart that God heard that prayer. God heard that prayer. <laughs> and God healed his little bladder and he didn't wet the bed anymore. And that was through a simple prayer in faith, believing that God could do that. So I I believe, I, I mean, I believe God can still heal. And I think there are people in this place that need healing from God. And I believe you can pray to this God, this God, Rapha, the God who heals. God's ear is not deaf, nor his arm short. God God can do anything he'd like to do. I don't know what you need, but but maybe that God would come and visit us in such a powerful way that God would heal us. God could heal us. Cherie was struggling with a terrible toothache, and this is uh, maybe five years ago, six years ago, I don't know, seven, I don't know how long ago it was. It was a pain in the mouth. And uh, she was constantly going to the Lord about this. And I remember one morning before she went to work, she said, Noel, come in here. Pray for me. So I remember I got over by her and I prayed. I placed my hands on her head and one on her mouth where her, her tooth was sore. And we just prayed and we said, God, would you, you can do anything. Lord, we're trusting you. We're, we're coming to you. Would you just touch her mouth and heal her? And she said she felt heat in her jaw. I didn't feel anything. My hand was right there on her jaw. I didn't feel a thing. But she felt heat in her jaw. And her tooth was restored. I I, I didn't go to school to learn anything like that. But you can learn in the school of the Bible what he says to do. And and so I guess I just say, what can God do in us as a people? More than physical healing, that's great, but our bodies are going to die, right? Bladders are going to die. Teeth are going to die. Bodies are going to die. But how much better if God would restore your soul so that your soul could live with God forever in heaven? God can do that. Maybe you have children that are far away from God. You have parents that are far away from God. You've got Brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles who don't know God, we've got to pray that God would bring healing and restoration to us, his people. It was through prayer. And and he got a heartening promise. I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to heal you. I'm going to heal you, Hezekiah. A human's participation, verse 7, it said, prepare a poultice of figs. Why? Why couldn't God just heal Hezekiah of these boils? I don't know. 
but he had them do something. So they got some, some uh, a poultice. They made up a poultice. They mixed it up and they applied like this salve to his boils on his body. And his body, Hezekiah's body was restored. Je- reminds me of Jesus. There was a time there was a blind man in John 9 and Jesus spat on the ground, made some mud and applied it to his eyes and said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And when he did, he came back seeing I don't know if God gives us aid to our faith. We have these little four bottles up here. It's anointing oil. There's nothing magical about oil or poultice of figs or mud that Jesus spits on. There's nothing magical about those. We're not into superstitious superstition. But God says to anoint people with oil and pray over them, and the prayer of faith will bring healing to them. Now, it's not in the oil. It's our faith in God that heals. And I guess God gives these kind of things to us to aid our faith. To say, you know what, I, it's going to be a tangible act. I can't see the intangible hand of God touching me, but I'm going to do what God says. I'm going to have oil applied to my head and pray in faith, and this tangible oil on my head will represent the intangible hand of God on my life. So there are times that that you use tangible things to see God's hand at work in your life. And so maybe that's why they prepared a poultice of figs for Hezekiah. A divine sign, 8 through 11. Do you find that very interesting? I studied the most on this message over this part right here because I have no idea how that happened. That the sun went backwards, or at least the shadow went backwards backwards 10 degrees or 10 steps. doesn't say whether that's 10 hours, 10 minutes, or if it just went back 10, like an eclipse, it just kind of went back. I read all kinds of commentaries about this, and after reading many commentaries on this verse, here's what I found. It was a miracle. (laughs) It was a miracle, and I kept looking for something. I'd read this commentary and this commentary, and I looked online here and here, and I I went to people and asked them, and, and at the end, everybody just scratches their head and says, Well, if God made the sun move backwards, all the machinery of heaven would also have to move backwards. And what a catastrophe that would be, except that God created all of it to begin with. And God can do whatever he pleases. And so God moved the shadow backwards 10 degrees or 10 steps. See the steps there by Hezekiah? that The shadow went backwards 10 degrees. (laughs) Remember the eclipse? Was that in August somewhere? The, the, the total eclipse we had? We had 88% here, and you had to go further north to get the total eclipse. But I remember my son, he was in Olathe, and he, he had his video, his phone out, and he's videoing, and all the birds went crazy. All the nocturnal animals were going nuts because it got dark for about 16, 17 minutes up there for him. And, and he had his camera, and all the lights were on on buildings. It tricked the electric department. It tricked birds, and it got dark. And as he videoed that, things were going crazy. I don't know what happened here that day whenever the shadow began to move backwards, if it, if it messed with nature, if it messed with people like, what's going on? I, Jason said time goes fast, fast, but now it's going backwards. I just gained some more time. I don't know how this happened except that it was a miracle. And I want, I want to tell you this, that we can't explain how God works. If we could, it wouldn't be a miracle. But that God works in miraculous ways in our hearts. You can be 85 years old and God can touch your heart and revive you. You can be 8.5 days old and God can touch you and restore your heart. God does miraculous things when we, with our little faith, trust in His bigness. Prayer, personal, family, corporate. Are you longing for more from God? Do you want more from Him? Do you want more from God? God wants you to have more. There's no limit to the Spirit that God will give to you. You go, yeah, but pastor, I don't know. Can God really do that? God can move a shadow backwards 10 degrees. God can do anything for you. You have not because you ask not. But when you ask, make sure you're asking with the right motives. Not for your own selfishness, but for the glory of God. How badly do you want revival? 
pray as a fa- pray personally. Pray as a family. Pray corporately. Wednesday night, I'm asking the whole church to come and to pray. Crowd this parking lot up and, and come in and pray at 6 o'clock and say, oh God, we want to have revival. We're going to pray. That's all we're going to be praying for this, 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 this Wednesday. Praying for revival. Praying for revival to come in our hearts. And then fast, a 24-hour prayer time to, to uh, seek the Lord. In conclusion, I'd like to just talk about this. There was a Welsh revival in 19, early 1900s, turn of the 20th century. Evan Roberts was just a young man. I want to give you some facts about him, and we're going to have a time of prayer here today. In the first few years of the 20th century, Wales experienced something unique. After many years of Christians praying for a spiritual reawakening, God answered their prayers, touching the country on multiple levels. One young man who had prayed for revival for over a decade became the person most associated with the events. His name? Evan Roberts. Evan's parents were pious members of a church. They valued prayer and memorized large portions of Scripture together. That environment developed an awareness of God in Evan at an early age. Listen, parents. When Evan was only 11 years old, his father died. He helped support his mother and siblings by going to work in a coal mine. The young Christian spiritual light shone in the darkness of the mines. While working, Evan prayed and sang hymns. During breaks, while other miners played cards, Evan read his Bible. As a young teenager, Evan began teaching a Sunday school class. He eventually uh, served his home church as Sunday school superintendent. He was also a pianist and a song leader. His spiritual disciplines increased. He sometimes prayed into the night for hours. In 1902, at the age of 24, Evan apprenticed with his uncle as a blacksmith. But a stronger pull drew the young man. In 1904, he began classes to prepare for a life of ministry. His preparation came sooner than expected. Evan and some other students attended services conducted by an evangelist named Seth Joshua. Evan heard the evangelist pleading in prayer, Bend us, O Lord! Bend us, O Lord! Evan personalized and echoed that prayer, O Lord, bend me. That day, Evan had a deeper spiritual experience. Here's how he described the feelings that followed. I felt ablaze with a desire to go through the length and breadth of Wales to tell of the Savior. He saw himself leading a team throughout Wales, calling for salvation decisions and surrender to the Holy Spirit. (laughs) Evan returned home. He told his family about his new experience and gushed about what God wanted to do in his hometown. He arranged to speak that weekend. His messages had four distinct parts. Number one, confess every known sin. Number two, put away every doubtful habit. Number three, obey the Holy Spirit promptly. And number four, confess Jesus publicly. Some of you have never done that before. Some of you have never done that. What would happen if all of us did at least those four things? That we would confess every known sin. We'd put away every doubtful habit. We would obey the Holy Spirit promptly. We'd confess Jesus publicly. To finish this story, up to 60 persons responded to the appeal that first week. A southern Wales newspaper reported that Evan was causing great surprise by his extraordinary orations at the chapel. That place of worship having been besieged by dense crowds of people unable to obtain admission. Then Evan, his brother Dan, and three sisters who sang took the message on the road. Evan and Dan preached in mining communities throughout southern Wales. Evan continued his exceptional prayer life. At each new town, he went to the mines to introduce himself to the miners as they emerged from the ground. He gave each a personal invitation to attend his meetings. In every village and town, the same results occurred. Large crowds gathered, people confessed and repented their sins, and behaviors changed. The transformation of thousands of lives in Wales led to social repercussions. Taverns began losing business. The crime rate decreased. People from other countries heard about what God was doing in Wales and came to see for themselves. Once the service began, visitors' lives were touched, but not not like in any service they attended before. Evan might preach or he might stand at the pulpit and weep. 
He might speak softly or silently pray. Responses at the pew included silent prayers, confession of sins, and spontaneous hymn singing. In every town, people of all ages turned to follow God, and churches grew. Brockington Road, Church of the Nazarene. I want God to come and visit us in a powerful way. But we've got to at least do these four things. What kind of a response do you want from God when you pray to Him? What do you want God to do in your life and in your family's life? If God could have right of way to do anything He'd choose to do, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth just as it is in heaven, what would it look like?